Stephen Fry emerged from Cambridge Footlights along with Emma Thompson, Hugh Laurie and other university wits. And today he reigns supreme as film star, television host, television guest, novelist, expert on English poetry and drafty don of a Cambridge college where he gets frequent opportunities to remind his fellow dons that he still knows everything. Underneath it all, he suffers from clinical depression, perhaps just to make the rest of us feel better about knowing only something. When I first saw you in action, I thought, you know, this guy is meant to be a don, and here he is fully around on screen, and now, lo and behold, you are a don, aren't you? You're, well, I am, a college. An, I am an honorary fellow of my college, that's true. Which it's college called, is that? It's Queen's College in Cambridge. And I have to say, yes, I, I is, was it Churchill who said, oh, uh, was it young men sow wild oats and old men grow sage? And I had thought that I would probably spend my life growing tweed in, in a court or quad somewhere. Um, partly because I had sowed so many wild oats, I think that when I got to Cambridge and suddenly got the breath of the academic life and got a whiff of what used to be called the life of the mind, um, I was enchanted and glamorised by it in a way that I hadn't imagined I would be. I thought I'd be enchanted and glamorised by the young people who were my contemporaries and, and that uh, I would uh, be whisked off into their world of... Um, a mixed world of either, you know, high serious journalism, politics or other such things. Instead, perhaps a little like you, I, I've always kept this very great belief and love of the high and the low simultaneously. Because what I want to know now, now that you're back at High Table, which some would say you'll be long, mm. uh, what are you getting from them? I know what they're getting from you. I, I, I'm sure they find it, they ask you all the questions about show business. Whenever I've been at High Table, I get asked about film stars. There That's I am so expecting true. to discuss atomic physics and Persian carpets. I know. Um, it's it's it, You're always looking in others f f for, for quite the opposite of what they're looking for in you. And, and I remember seeing this once at a, at a cricket match um, when I saw M Mick Jagger and Ian Botham sitting together, and both in their pomp. Well, Mick Jagger stood in his pomp. And Mick Jagger was talking about, I don't know why they don't, you know, he doesn't bowl the arm ball and they get, give himself a short <laughs> forward square. And, and Ian Botham was going about, so like, you're on a gig, OK, so how many girls come <laughs> round afterwards? And, and you think there's just no point at which they're ever going to yeah. want to talk about the same thing. Actually, my, almost my first memory of hearing Cambridge academics talking was when I'd gone up for an interview and I saw these two figures in gowns with the hands clasped behind their back in approved fashion, like in a print somewhere, looking like crows, you know, uh, walking through a, an archway. And I, and I followed to, to hear what they were discussing, hoping it would be what... Wittgenstein said to them once, or whatever it might be. And they said, no, it's made by a company called Knorr, spelt with a K, Knorr, and it's a sort of comminuted uh, noodle substance, a hard <laughs> pasta, uh, and all you do is add boiling water, but I can assure you it's singularly toothsome. And I thought, well, there you are, you see. Yeah. That's what academics talk about. But what I get out of the high table at Queen's is that, the, I mean, there's a marvellous tradition of... of people in different disciplines having a kind of uh, wary view each of the other each of the other's art and I like the fact that if a Don seriously absolutely thoroughly disapproves of somebody almost in a moral ideological intellectual on every basis they'll say well while Professor Judd and I have some points of disagreement, none yields uh, to, to his genius uh, like I. Whereas if there is a small issue, like whether or not a heated fruit pie is more is better than a cold fruit <laughs> yeah. pie, so he's an imbecile, he's a dunderhead, he's a fool, he knows nothing. Yeah. But I do, I do relish the whole Donish world of... It, it is a kind of tolerance, even when the odium theologicum is raging, mm. even when they hate mm. each other, there's still quite often a a tolerance for, for human behaviour that can actually be extremely important. One of the things that the Dons put up with, I thought, in an inspiring way, was us, mm. the goof-offs, yeah, right? Yeah. Because if you went uh, to Cambridge and you sort of started cutting lectures and not writing your papers because you're doing footlights and theatre and so on, yeah. instead of lining them up against a wall and shooting you, <laughs> which they had the power to do, they could have rusticated yeah. you like Shelley. They didn't yeah. do that. Mm. And that was a rather plus, wasn't it? It was, and I don't know how much it's still true today. I think it it, it is in 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 the old I, universities. I hope so, but, it, because it's yeah, incredibly important. The it's important that universities should not be efficient. Mm. Is, yeah. it, is it? Is it not? I think so yeah. entirely. I mean, there's a, there's a whole debate which 
in rhetoric is lost, but in practice, fortunately, isn't, which is quite a British thing, and that's to say that almost all political parties, certainly since the mid-70s, have gone on and on about how education essentially is almost indistinguishable from vocational training, which to you and me is a kind of anathema, I suspect. Yeah. To, to us, it's a very different thing that we still, perhaps elitistly, perhaps sentimentally, in, in, in all kinds of ways, hark back to the idea of the, the seven liberal arts and the liberal education, the opening of a mind, the, the asking of questions, and if anything, the absolute non-fitness for purpose, yes. uh, uh, to use that Non-utilitarian and doing things for their own sake, which it, is practically the definition of humanism. It, it, yeah. Exactly is. Exactly is. Both in science and in the arts, incidentally. But definitely the university wits were kind of in charge, were they not? Mm. Mm. They were, and I... I, I Someone, I think it was actually Simon, Simon Gray once <laughs> said to me, um, a man with whom I've had a spiky relationship over, over the past 10 or 12 years, but is, is, is a delightful fellow and, and very amusing. You were in one of his plays, right? I, I was, and then, and then suddenly wasn't as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, he said, of course, the only real advantage of going to Oxford or Cambridge is that you then don't have to deal with not having gone to Yeah. And, and I can fully understand that if I had not got into Cambridge, and had gone to another university, I would be... I, my view of the kind of people who went to Oxford and Cambridge would be coloured, to say the least. I mean, I would probably there want to use that. the yeah, W word in other a words, lot. What you're describing is a system. Yeah, and I would yes. see it as a cosy one. I would see it as a, as, 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 as a kind of a cosy nostra, as it's been called, as, a, as, you know, the Cambridge Mafia, the Oxbridge Mafia, Oxbridge Mafia, well, the all the different words that come for it, and it looks like it. All I can say is you feel the opposite at the time, at least I did. I would go into the Footlights Club room and I'd see pictures of John Cleese and Peter Cook and yourself and Jermaine Greer and Douglas Adams and Griff Rees Jones, who was a few years before me, and Clive Anderson, who was before me. And I'd see this past panoply, this pantheon of, of great comic talents and think, well, the door's shut after them. It's never going to happen again. And every time you're at Cambridge, the, almost the first thing you hear when you arrive is, apparently the footlights are crap this year. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly you know. <laughs> And well, so we thought, oh, we'll be crap. Well, that's the description of a tradition. It was yeah. always, It was always better. But uh, there's no doubt that, uh, that when people like Victoria Wood came along, yeah. things certainly started to expand in television and yeah. radio and so on. Yeah. Which was a good thing, I think. Oh, no question. I mean, no-one wants to see anything but the, the talent, talent getting through. I mean, nobody wants to see a world in which people have only got the job because of where they went to school. So what you're seeing is a big social change. I, I want to nail this down because mm. I want to talk to you about British society and... Mm and how you, in many ways, mirror part of it and can criticise the rest mm. and so on. And, uh, but there's definitely been a big, big change going on. Mm. And the idea of the gent mm. is gradually having less force. And you, in many ways, epitomise the gent. You're, mm. a, you're, you're a rogue gent, aren't you? <laughs> you're, not, you're, yes. you're not a bright yob, you're a rogue gent. I, I am, and, and I am shamefully a member of, of, of exclusive... Clubs, many of whom people haven't even heard of, they're so exclusive, and they have the odd... There's one club I'm a member of where uh, all the club servants are called Charles because the members... It, it's hundreds of years old and members have never bothered to learn the names. And, and you literally hear a conversation as somebody comes in uh, patting the sides of their pockets as, as, as well-bred people do all the time. They sort of do this a lot, I don't know why. And, and, and saying, hello, Charles, where's, where's Charles? And they go, oh, oh, Charles can come in today. So, so Charles asked me to take over. Oh, fair enough. Well, well if you see him, tell, tell him that I saw Charles earlier and, and that he wished him well as well. You know, and you can, it's, it's how, does the Prince of, how does the Prince of Wales take it when he comes in? <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah, you're not a, not a Russian spy. You never were. It was huge sadness to me that I don't think I was ever approached. I'm surprised you weren't approached for MI5. For your... I'm not sure if I was. I did. <laughs> I, I, got I got invited to all kinds of <laughs> odd things, odd... Odd, you know, have a glass of I ratafia. Know, I know these things. <laughs> a yes. glass of ratafia, they would say. And They're being it, sized up by mystery and or, or a strange, do you like Sethial or Bual Madeira? And you'd think, is that the test? <clears throat> if I don't really know the difference between Sethial and Bual Madeira, am I going to prove inadequate to serving my country? Or is it, is it merely he's actually trying to stroke my thigh, which is unlikely? You but never it, know, you see, when an old man says, I want you to come and uh, see me in my rooms. I'd like to get to know you better. You don't quite know what's going Whether on. Whether he's going to send you off in a mission to... Because <laughs> yeah. the Soviet The, the Union. other thing is the, is the marvellous tradition of um, wild, gay, uh, uh, wild gay practices amongst, amongst dons there. There was, a, <laughs> there, was a, there was an extraordinary figure. I don't want to narrow him down to... But he was an Could academic... Make him identifiable. In, 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 is, no. he, is he alive now? I think he may still be. He's pretty, pretty yeah. old. But he was at a, we were, there was a very grand dinner in, in one of the older colleges. And uh, 
he was boasting of some conquest, some, some Corvo-like conquest in Venice that he had made. And he said, and my dear, he was, he was, he was I, I'm proud to say he was a true gondolier. And 